Sweet in the morning Oh Lord It's sweet in the morning Chato Sweet in the morning Sweet in the morning This is an interview with Mrs. Rosa P. Washington for the Oral History Project of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. I'm Dr. Horace Huntley. Today is April 14, 1995, and we're at Miles College. Thank you, Ms. Washington, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and sit and talk with us today. Thank uh, you. It's yes, ma'am. a blessing to do so. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> I just want to start by just getting a little background information. Tell me... Um, were you born in Birmingham? I was born in a little town called Davenport, Alabama. Davenport. Where is Davenport, Alabama? About 25 miles south of Montgomery, yeah. between Montgomery and Lady Hatcher. Okay. Um, were both of your parents from that area of the state? My father was, but my mother was a little town called Sandy Ridge, not too far from Greenville, Alabama. Okay, the same direction. Then. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Tell me a little about your parents. They were very diligent, hardworking people. When they came to Birmingham, my daddy rented for a year, and he said he couldn't get the kind of house he wanted, but he bought the, the property and built an inexpensive house with the intention of leaving the South when I started to high school. But his health prevented him from doing that. Tell me a little about their experiences uh, in Davenport. What did, what did he do in Davenport? He was a farmer, and uh, he was a sharecropper farmer, and he had three brothers in that area, why he hesitated so long to move to Birmingham. Then the youngest brother came to Birmingham and went to work, and he, he, he didn't come until I said I wanted to see White men work rather than riding around kicking dirt on me. Okay. You're going to get to that one. Uh -huh. Let me ask you, how many brothers and sisters did you have? One brother. One 13 brother. years difference in our ages. Okay. Are you younger? Or older? Younger. You were younger. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about the education of your parents. My daddy didn't go any further than the third or fourth grade, and my mother went to the fifth. Uh -huh. And... And they were sharecroppers yes. in South Alabama. Right. Um, and how long, how long did you stay in Davenport? Were your, your parents, I know you eventually would come to Birmingham. Why would uh, your parents decide to come to Birmingham at the time that they did? Because my daddy wanted to please me. I told him I didn't want to be on the farm. Hmm. Well, white men ride around, kick dirt on me. Tell me about that. What did, how did that happen? You were. I was a child playing in a large cotton basket. My parents were hoeing, and this chat, owner of the farm came riding by on his big stallion horse, and he drove up beside my back, rode up beside my basket where I was playing, and threw candy in the basket to me, and the horse kicked dirt in the basket on me. I became angry, jumped up and turned the basket upside down, and went running down the road calling my daddy. And he, the man was right behind me on the horse, and daddy didn't like that. He said, why are you chasing her? He said, she didn't want me to give her candy. She pulled it out because the horse kicked dirt in her basket. And I asked daddy, when are you going to get a job where white folks work and not ride around and kick dirt on me? So and, you you didn't think that he was doing any work. He was just riding around harassing you. That's right. Mm -hmm. And what did your mother say uh, in that regard? Well, my mother had always had been after him for a while to leave and come to Birmingham to find work. And when she got up to the area where he was holding me, he locked his arms around me and dropped to his knees and my mother asked him, said, why are you holding that child like that? And she's squirming, and both of you wringing wet with sweat. 
And he jumped and looked at her as if she dropped out of space. He didn't know who she was. And he just took a deep breath and let me go. And when we got home to dinner, he just kept looking at me and cut his eye at her and looked at me again. And he said, uh, can you handle the farm at harvesting time? I'm going to Birmingham and look for me a job. I don't intend for my girl child, which is where he referred to me, to ask me the question that she asked me today. And she said, what? He told her, I didn't, why couldn't I get a job where white folks work and not drive around kicking dirt on me? And she was glad. And she told him, well, don't worry, just don't worry. But she felt like getting up, hugging me to do it. Because <laughs> she was ready to leave the farm. And she was ready to leave the farm. Yeah. And when harvesting time come, he came to Birmingham and fortunate enough to find a job. What was his first job in Birmingham? Do you remember? Uh, working at a SIPCO plant. Mm -hmm. And how American long did he... American Cast Iron Pipe. Yes. How long did he work at a SIPCO? It, that was from 20 to 31 when he had a stroke. So you were, how old were you when you uh, came to Birmingham to live? Eight, uh, not quite eight. Mm -hmm. uh, what part of, you lived in a SIPCO at the time? Y yes. So uh, what school did you attend? West of SIPCO school. What do you remember about uh, your school? Oh, I thought it was fantastic because we had the school building wasn't quite large enough for all the classes. And the first through the third went to school in a church that was nearby. And uh, when, in the later years, I don't remember exactly what year, but there was a Mr. Uh, Walker was there. And uh, Mr. Uh, Can't call the man's that. name now, but anyway, they moved. Uh, they, they he was living in a double store, two story building, mm -hmm. and uh, when Sipco changed and turned the school over to the public school system, he made those men move out of that building, and that building was called a domestic science building. Mm -hmm. they, they taught you table manners, how. Uh, boys how to escort girls in a building and how to pull the chair up to the table and let the girl sit down and ease her back up to the table. Taught us to make beds, how to keep house, really. It was called a domestic science building. And they taught sewing and some shoe repair. So the school was actually owned by Sipico initially. Yes, at first. And then they uh, deeded the school to the to the Birmingham school system. Right. What school did you attend after SIPCO? When I finished the SIPCO, I went to Lincoln. I guess you would call it a mid-school. I went to Lincoln from the ninth through the 10th grade, and then went to Industrial High. Uh, industrial High, that at that time was termed to be the largest high, high school uh, in the world for black folk. That's, that's, what, that's, that's what it right. was suggested. That, that's right. What do you remember about industrial high school? I thought it was great. Um, Professor Parker was a principal of the school, and he always stressed, don't saw these uniforms, because the girls wore blue and the boys wore khaki until they got in the 12th grade. And after that, the girls had to wear white and the men wore dark suits, blue trousers, or uh, blue suit. So you were immaculately dressed yes. in, at Industrial High. Right. Yeah. Um, what, um, I know it being an industrial school, there were a number of areas that you could sort of concentrate in. What were some of those areas? There was dressmaking, beauty culture, carpentry, shoemaking, and tailoring. I know that uh, there were all... And printing, I forgot. And printing. Mm -hmm. What area did you concentrate in? And I was interested in dramatics, and I was trying to take dramatics. 
and I had a letdown with dramatics. Um, better cut this off while I tell this in the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> I was training for the leading lady part. Every, every, every part had two persons to see which one would handle it the best. And I was given the, the part, and I was, oh, I was so proud to be the leading lady, the mistress, as it was called. And I would perform before my family, friends, on the school ground, my friends, and they would say, Rosa, you got it, you got it. And uh, Edna Elliott had the, we had the same part. And when I, we, we practiced, and the teacher said I had done well, then Edna come up. Edna didn't remember her lines in some instances and said that she wasn't putting enough action in it. And uh, when it was over, Mrs. White told me, Rosa, you performed beautifully, and I admire the way you have learned and studied. Said, but this part is for a white mistress, and you are too dark for that part. And I give it to Edna. Mm. So you lost your part as a result of being too dark. Uh -huh. And I didn't, kids now would have threw a fit on her, but I didn't. I picked up my books, and I was grasping like that, trying to keep from crying, and going across the campus to another classroom. And I met Mrs. Mahalia Morris, and she was very dark. She taught math. And she called me Sipco Skinny because I didn't weigh 90 pounds. And she saw, she said, Sipco Skinny, what's wrong with you? You act like you're about to explode. I said, I'm all right. And she stopped me. She said, no, you're not. What is wrong? Then I burst out and went to crying and told her what had been said to me. She said, don't let nobody put you down. Dry your tears. She took her handkerchief and wiped my tears. She said, get right in here, get something up here, and tell the world to go to hell. <laughs> said, nobody, everybody knows I know this book that I have. She was teaching math and algebra. And she said, I found an error in this book that the company had to recall when I sent it to them. And I got big bucks for it. And I defy anybody to do more with the teaching of this, su these subjects than I can. And say, that's what you do. Don't get hurt about your color. God made us all. How did that experience impact you in your life? At, at a, for a while, while I was in school and as a youngster, I felt put down because for years, the lighter people tried to put the darker skin aside. And at that time, Parker had more light teachers, light complexion teachers, fair skin than they did darker teachers. Because they say that's what Professor Parker stressed. Did, were there any other examples of this division based on color at Parker? Were there other kids that were impacted upon in the same way. Yes, the some said they felt it too. What about your, <clears throat> excuse me, your um, majorettes and your your various teams? Did they mirror that kind of mentality? Uh, Somewhat, yes, they did. Mm -hmm. But if you were good, really good, they had to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. What grade were you in when that took place? Do you remember? It, about my incident. What, what grade were you? Yeah. I think it's about the eleventh grade. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, were you living in Sipco? Yes, I was. Can you describe your community? What was what was Sipco like? It was the common, hard-working people, and most of it was rental property. There was some few homeowners on Twenty Sixth Avenue and further up, but the area where I live, the alley divided my area from separate the white. After you pass 29th Alley Avenue or 28th Alley, they were all white. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, <clears throat> so most of the people that live there work for Sipco? Yes. 
quite a few. Mm -hmm. Were there other occupations that people had in that area, do you remember? No, some worked at Dickie Clay plant, mm -hmm. and some worked at Inslee plant. Mm -hmm. There were a few who had, had taken nurse training, one or two were in that area. Did your mother work outside of the home? No, she didn't. What was your community's relationship to the Birmingham Police Department? Oh, wow. Whenever they would come in the neighborhood, if it was next door, you could hear them banging if you were in your bed because they always knocked so severely, so hard. And uh, I have been told by some young men that they would just see them on the street and call them to the car. And when they get there, they'd roll the window down and ask them some questions and then roll it up where they couldn't get their head out and beat them on the head. After you finished industrial high school, what did you do? I just, I worked at Britlin, I think, and trying to get ready, try to save some money to go to college because my father had had a stroke and he couldn't send me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met this young man come down to visit his father from Pittsburgh, and we fell in love. And he told me if I would marry him, I told him I wanted to go to college. Well, if you marry me, I'd take you back to Pittsburgh and send you to Penn State. But uh, after we were married, he took me up to Penn State nearly every Sunday or Saturday or whatever they had up there for entertainment. He'd take me up there, and I told him, I'm tired of going up sightseeing. I want to go in. He said, well, I, when I can get a better job, I'll send you. And the second year he was there, he contracted tuberculosis, and I didn't get to go to college. In five years of our marriage, he passed, and I moved back to Birmingham. My father had passed. My brother had uh, had a tragedy in the family, and and uh, the mother died, the children's mother, he had five children, and I was left to take care of the children. I was home a year and a month and lost my mother in death. And I was, I was crushed because so many tragic things had happened in my life. And I went to work, and my mother was on welfare, and I had to report her death. And when I reported it, she was only getting $25 a month. And they asked me, was I working? I said, yes, how much do you earn? I said, $7 a week. Well, that's more than allowed for family your side. So they cut me off. I said, I'm just keeping my brother's children. They're not my children, they said, but you are the head of the house. And you will, we'll have to cut you off and you support the children. And that was real. Six people to be taken care of. Seven dollars a week. Seven dollars a week. Where were you working at the time? I was working at New Bears. Oh. What, uh, did you, what did you do at New, New Bears? I was a maid at New Bears. There was a dress shop there then. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I worked there. And uh, the, the band on Monday and Thursday, I had to work at the manager's house. And when I worked, they would go partying and come in at 1 and 2 o'clock and take me home. And I was expected to be at work at the same time at the store as usual. So when the maid quit, she kept trying to get me to work in the house. And I told her I had a responsibility that I couldn't do that. But I didn't tell her what it was. And she kept having me wish washy back and forth. And she told me, uh, that I, they let me work at the home when the maid quit, and I told her that I, could, uh, I couldn't stay as late as I did there, and I asked for more money, and she said she couldn't pay any more money because when I worked there, I got three meals a day, wherein if I was at the store, I had to pay for my lunch and bring my uh, br and bring my eat my breakfast at home and bring my lunch. So giving me three meals would supply the, the, the fair income. Mm -hmm. And I kept, they kept working me like that. And a friend of the family moved from the farm and I carried her on the job and they made it. She kept her. And uh, 
I kept going and work on Monday and Thursday. So one morning when I got there, I was making my breakfast. And I told her I couldn't get there at 7 because of my responsibility. I would come at the same time I went to the store. And she asked me, after the woman was there about a couple of months, she said, Rosa, why is it that Mamie has to be here at 7 o'clock to get man his breakfast to get him off to work? And you come in and, and she has had her breakfast. You show up at 9 and you making your breakfast. I said, I beg your pardon. I understood her, but I wanted to see. And she said, uh, she repeated it. I said, well, these were your plans. You told me you couldn't pay me any more money, and three meals would be a supplement of my salary. Don't stand there and do your proper talking, booking your big eyes at me. You got to work with them five youngins you got there. And I, I said, if you can show me God Almighty's hand writing on the wall, Telling me I got to work for a poor ass Jew like you, I'll be here to hell for you, so. Mm. And she said something else, snares it to me, and I reached for I forgot the clothes. I had put the clothes in soap on a bar stove, stew. She did not have a washing machine. And I reached for and that water and clothes went all over the place. And the girl that was working, she said, uh uh-uh, uh, uh, girl, don't you do that. What's the matter with you? I said, take your hands off of me. If you hadn't flapped your lips, she wouldn't know what to say to me. Let me get out of here. And I grabbed my work clothes and made a dash for the door. And she said, you needn't show up at the store, the, the woman. You needn't show up at the store. I said, who wants to show up at the store? I'm sick of you Jews. Mm-hmm. And I left. And I had people, I had 75 cents between me, help me out in the pool house. And I had to use a dime of that to get to get home. When I got to town, I used a nickel to call my date and tell him that I could go see Duke Ellington. He was coming to town. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, shut up. Let me go get my tickets. Because after 10 o'clock, the tickets go up. And I went home. And you went to see Duke Ellington. I went to see Duke Ellington. (laughs) (laughs) And when I awakened the next morning, I said, my gosh, it's Thursday. And I'd rather wait till the first of the week and go see about a job. So I gave it, got the kids at breakfast and I went back to bed. About 11 o'clock, my best friend through the years, she came. She said, girl, what in the world is wrong with you? I called the store and they say you weren't there. I called the house and the woman almost hung up in my face telling me you weren't there. And I told her what had happened. She said, well, God bless you. The Lord look here. Take care of fools and babies. <laughs> <laughs> With this heavy responsibility you have, you have walked off of your job. And Mr. Townsend has observed you. She worked, and she was off half an hour for lunch. And I had an hour for lunch. And I would walk up there and visit with her on her lunch period. So Mr. Townsend was her, her boss? Yes. And, uh, and he said, I admire that a girlfriend of yours that comes here. She does not wrestle and tussle and chase the porters. She just stands around and waits until you can talk to her. And she's very courteous and polite. Because he told me one day, you keep hanging around here, I'm going to put you to work and I'll give you a dime. <laughs> I said, well, we'll see about that. And she, he told her if, to come get me and see if I would work. I left, got to the station at 11 o'clock. And they sent me to Dr. Thuss for a physical. And he didn't show up until 4.30 to give me his exam. And he told his nurse, this has been one hectic day. I am so tired and started pulling off his coat. She said, don't undress yet. Greyhound has someone here. I said, what's wrong with him? I said, it's not a she. And he said, come here, Catherine. That was my friend's name. And he said, no, she's not Catherine. Her name is Rosa. And I don't know anything about Rosa, so when I walked in, she told him I was to be there for my physical for them to hire me. He said, stick out your tongue. He put that paddle in there and had me say, ah. Then he took my pulse. And he said, do you have a honey? I said, no. Do you have hemorrhoids? I said, no. He wrote me out the statement that I was hired. He said, you go on. If they don't hire you, I will. Come back here. (laughs) So... Did they hire you? Yes, they hired me. And how long were you there? 
with working at Greyhound. Yes. Thirty seven years and four months. Thirty seven and four. So they must have been pleased with your work. They were. <laughs> Sometimes they jump my gun and I I am an outspoken person if you push me too far. Give me an example of them jumping your gun. Uh, we had a mop pail that you had to push down on the lever to, and pull up on the mop to ring the mop. And it had been broken for about three months. And the manager kept promising and promising. So the thing popped loose and hit me on my leg, and it was so painful. And as dark as I am, it was just fiery red, but it didn't break the skin. I went in the office and I told him, Mr. Drennan, look at my leg. What are you going to do? Wait until that scrub bucket injure us. We've been tying it with rope and string and whatever. And I don't want my leg broken. Oh, I just forgot. I said, well, if you give me the money, I'll walk down to Wimbledon Thomas's and get in my bucket. So he gave me a $20 bill. And I walked down to Wimbledon Thomas on Morris Avenue and 20th Street and got the bucket. But I was too black and proud to walk that far carrying that heavy bucket. I used a dime for trolley fare. When I got back, I gave him the receipt for the bucket and counted out the change. And I told him I used a dime for transportation. What are you talking about? I didn't tell you to authorize you for transportation. I make the, you got to give the company, that's that company's money. I said, well, I'll tell the company that you didn't give us supplies and I had to go get it and I think I'm entitled to transportation. You're going to give me my dime and I turned and walked off. It was so often he would ask me, he'd see me working, give him his dime. And I'd just look at him and smile and walk off. So I was cleaning the white lobby, sweeping in the lobby, and a white woman's baby was sore and she asked me to get her some wet paper towels or whatever to clean the baby. When I brought her the soap, wet towels and some driving to clean her baby, she gave me two dimes and a nickel, tipping me. And I thanked her. He was standing about as far off as it started for it. And he called me, said, Rosa, come here. When I walked over to him, he said, I saw that woman give you two dimes and a nickel. Now give me your dime, my dime. I said, I don't have your dime. He said, give me my dime. You owe me a dime where you took it out there uh, for bus, for trolley fare. I said, I couldn't afford to walk six miles carrying that heavy bucket, six blocks carrying that heavy bucket, and that's why I used a dime. Well, what are you talking about? There are hundreds of colored women who would be glad to walk not only six blocks but six miles for the salary you're making. Hmm. I hadn't shoved that broom handle in his chest. I said, well, the first one that comes along till it starts sweeping. You he were... handed it back to me and got back. You better get this floor swept. So I went on and swept the floor. So he didn't bother you about the dime any longer. And when I finished sweeping, I went in to check the lady's lounge. The cashier, the owner of the restaurant, she came dashing in behind me. She said, you better be glad that Mrs. Mr. Owens is a kind-hearted gentleman. A mini-boss would have fired you with your sassy talk. I said, if I was slinging hash for you, I guess you would have fired me. Before I let anybody drag me down, I'll crawl the street on my hands and knees and pick peanuts out of elephant dropping. She said, well, Miss Rosa, well, Miss Rosa. I said, thank you. And I went on about my business. She said, well, Miss Rosa. Uh-huh. And for the life of her stay there, she referred to me as Miss Rosa. Was, was that unusual for a yes. white woman to say Miss to a black woman? That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, further incident, the traveler's aid booth was in the lobby. And one day she called me to her. said, Rosa, I want to ask you something. I, you are intelligent, and I like to talk with you. Uh which of your people do you have the most respect for? I said, what'd you say? Which of you people do you have most respect for, the lighter skin or the darker skin? I said, <laughs> I said be they white, black, mulatto, Indian, sewer, crow. The people that do most for humanity are the people that we look up to. 
Thank you, Miss Rosa. And I was Miss Rosa to her from then on. So you would not back off any of them, right? Mm -mm. You didn't take any mm -mm. anything from anyone. Because my father always told me, whoever you're talking to or whoever is talking to you, look them in the eye. Don't get an itch somewhere or some dirt on your foot and squirming and looking off. Look them in the eye. Your, what were your responsibilities there? I was a maid. I was supposed to take care of the uh, late, white and colored waiting room, supposed to keep the, uh, the baggage room swept, ticket office swept, mm -hmm. and take care of the black waiting room. Mm -hmm. And the white waiting room, they had about six toilets, two washrooms. Two of them were washrooms where you pay a quarter to go in and you could stand and get washed up and face bowl. Other, the others, there was a face bowl out for all the public. In the colored waiting room, as it was called then, there were seats, benches with dividers in them. And there was a window, I'd say about an opening, about two foot, a square opening. And when there were two armed chairs there, if you ordered food, you rang a bell for food and they would bring the food to the black passengers and they would sit there and eat. If they were all, more people ordered, they'd have to sit on those benches and eat. Mm -hmm. There was one ticket window exposed to the black area. There were three or four, three I think, on the white side. Mm -hmm. Now, in this period, we're talking about a totally segregated society. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did that manifest itself? in the bus station? Were there obviously separate? There were uh, separate waiting rooms mm -hmm. and separate bathroom, dress room. And the ticket window faced, the larger part of it faced the white lobby. And there's this one window which served the black. Mm -hmm. And the agents sometimes would just stand there and wait on, wait on all that was in the front and not take turns and turn around and wait on those in the window. What community did you live in at that time? At that Where, time, I was living in a zip code. You were still living in a zip code. Right. When did you, did you move from a zip code to another community? I moved in 60, in 61, 60. in 61. To what uh, community? Where I am now, on Enon Ridge. Mm -hmm. And your, your community, was it an active community? Did you have... Um, uh, community organizations no. that did not have any. Mm -mm. Uh, were you ever a member of the NACP? Yes, I joined the NACP through my church. Okay. What mm -hmm. church was you? Thurgood Semi Church. Okay. On the corner of Center Street and Six Center Street and Sixth Avenue. Um, were you a registered voter? Yes. When they allowed us to vote, I registered to vote. Can you tell me how that, when did you, when did you register to vote and if there were, do you remember any incident that took place? Was it very difficult to register to vote or was it a no, simple process? No, they had broken it, the civil process mm -hmm. that we, we were eligible to vote. And we had to go up and register to vote and have questions asked about different political areas. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you ever attend any of the mass meetings of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights? Any of the mass meetings when Dr. King was in town? Uh, yes. Uh, Shuttlesworth uh, was speaking. Because he used to, he preached a couple of sermons there at the AOH Church of God that was located on 7th Avenue and 18th Street mm -hmm. at that time. Now, at the time that you were working at the bus station, in 1961, there was a, a group of students from the North that came and they were called Freedom Riders. Right. Were you working the day that they came in? Yes. Did you witness uh, what happened as a result of them coming into Birmingham? Yes. I was sweeping the, what they call white waiting room then, facing 19th Street. The entrance to the black waiting room was facing the back. And I was sweeping, and I was nervous and tense.
because I had heard that they were coming, and it was Mother's Day when I uh, heard the doors. There were two front entrances. One would let you out and one was supposed to come in, but they both opened at the same time. They would make a sound, and when I looked around, those black youth were coming in. Some went in the down dining room, some went in the uh, men's room, some four went in the ladies' room. And when they went in there, the white women rushed out as if a wild animal had come in there. And it was just a trauma. And when the news got back to the uh, manager of the restaurant, he came running in, and just that, that door is there, there was a window for the baggage room, and on each side was a water fountain. He ran, oh, I'd say about 10 feet past it, popped his finger and whirled around him, yanked the wiring out of the wall from the fountain so there would be no cool water. And that brought a lump to my throat because that meant no cool water for white or black. Then he rushed down the to the restaurant, and when he got there, he the blacks were in there. He tried to get them out. And he had a worker stand at the door and not let any more in. And they were, those that were in there were trying to order food. He demanded that the workers remove the food from the steam table and leave menus out for the whites. And when he, I, that brought tears because black and white hands prepared the food Black and white hands were removing the food, yet black and white could not sit in the same room and eat the food. Were there both black and white students that came in on the bus or was it just black? I didn't see anything but black, but somebody told me there was some white mm -hmm. with them. The same day, there were those that there were some that were attacked. Right. Did you witness any of the attacks? No, I did not because the bus was set afire in Anniston. And Bull Connor, the commissioner of farm government we had, he was the commissioner. And the news were broadcasting about the Freedom Riders coming. And he went to the city limit line and waited for it. When they got there, he boarded, flagged the bus and, and boarded the bus and told them not to come into Birmingham. They weren't wanted here. And they told him they would be back. He had a regiment of policemen with him. But they turned around and said they would come back. And then Bill Connor brought his regiment to the bus station. They were out on the loading zone where the buses come in. And they were cursing and saying ugly things about what was going to happen when the damn niggas get here. And uh, I was tense and afraid because don't know who's mean enough to throw a bomb in there and get me. And uh, I waited, and very nervously. And this, uh, the four girls that went into the restroom, the whites came out like they were scared to death. And this one little white woman, she sat near the door where she could see the track and get to the restroom before time for her to get on the bus. And she looked up, she said, well, here's them damn niggas. She rushed into the lounge. And I tried to console her, step father to console her, and she let me know she didn't want to be bothered. And uh, those kids were there. And when I left, I worked a release shift. I left at 3.30. I hung around a little longer, but my shift was over at 3.30. And I had to be back the next morning at 7 o'clock. When I got back at 7 o'clock, those kids were still there. And I was so nervous, I didn't rest well. I bought my breakfast and my lunch. When I went into the ladies' lounge to clean in there, three girls were in there gagging, perspiring and crying, half crying. And I told them, have you had any food? They said, no, ma'am. I said, well, I brought my lunch and my breakfast. I said, I'll share it with you. Or I'll get permission to go to the a &P up on the corner and get you some fruit or some juice. They both stepped forward and looked me in my eye. No, ma'am, thank you. We will not accept your food. We are dedicated to a change. And if you give us food, you're helping to defeat our cause. The four of us locked arms and cried. So they would not accept the food? Uh-uh, no. 
and about uh, nine, ten o'clock, somewhere along that time, a big, burly, heavy set policeman came in with a canine on leash and his billy stick and cufflinks jingling on his hip. A well dressed, tall man was with him, and I believed him to be a detective. And they passed me, and just as they, before they got out of earshot from me, he said, Tell me, I hear tell her one of these little niggas going to pray this morning. I want to see what he's going to hear, what he's going to tell God when I turn this dog loose on his back ass. That brought a shudder. I just started spot sweeping and running, trying to hear what was going to be said or done. A little bit after they got out there, a young black man, I wish I knew who he was, stepped up on a float. That's a wagon that pushed the luggage, locked his hands behind his back, and raised his face toward heaven. And he prayed. I don't remember all of his prayer, but this he said, Dear God, we keep their houses. We take care of their children. We prepare their food. Please, God, tell these pharaohs to let your people go. All we want is a place uh, to choose our place to sit down. And that touched you. It touched me and touched him, too. A little bit later, he came through there. Both of them had a stern look on their face, the two that had just passed through. And the fat one was dabbing his eyes. I can't swear it was tears, but he was patting his face as if there were tears. So what happened to those individuals, those young people? They were there until later on in the night, later on in the evening because I was off at three. But later on, uh, Attorney General Robert Pierce, uh, Kennedy called and told them to get them out of there to Birmingham, uh, to Montgomery, where they were traveling. Who did Kennedy call? He called the uh, Mr. Hunt and Mr. Owens, G.J. Uh, G. Owens, I don't remember Hunt's name, but whoever the officials were, they got the call. How did you know that they had gotten the call? I was told that they got a call. Okay, so the um, word was circulating that Kennedy the had called. Attorney General Kennedy had called and told him to get them on their way. And a bus driver, Joe Cavanero, took them mm -hmm. to Montgomery. And I was told that the policeman escorted them out of the city to the city limit. Did you get any more actively involved in the movement after you witnessed this at the bus station? No, my working hours didn't allow me to, you know, get in the parade or walk or job. But I did walk down to Booker Washington School on my lunch break. And I saw them when they turned the hose on connected, they had a fire hose connected to spray the kids with that phosphor water, but it did no water come out. Hmm. No water came out. No. But you witnessed the attempt yes. the, for the, the fire department to use the hoses on the on the marches. Right. But this was this when the children were marching? Right. Mm -hmm. um, what was your reaction? to seeing, the, seeing this event? It couldn't help but bring tears to my eyes. I was sad and, and almost afraid to walk the street alone because some whites were arrogant toward all blacks. Mm -hmm. But the change come, and Mr. Herman Hardy, he was a porter. They got him into being assistant manager at Greyhound, and in 63, they had, a, up, until the, up until the Freedom Riders, everybody was classified. Poters, maids, and cleaners were Class B employees. The whites, ticket agents, baggage agents, express agents, office personnel were white. Did that change? As a result yes. of the, the Freedom Riders? Yes, it did. Because mm -hmm. Mr. Herman Hardy was made 
assistant supervisor. And then to get into a higher job classification, they had a question and answer elimination program. And I tried to get my best friend who got me the job to take the test, and she was leery about taking it. And she got sick, and uh, I told her I was off, and I would come to see her, and she asked me to stop at the terminal and get her a sick plane. While I was in there, it hit me like a thunderbolt. When I turned around and saw the manager, I asked him if I could take the test. He said, well, Miss Rosa, you older now. I said, both of us are 10 minutes older than I was when we walked in here. He said, and he said some more remarks. I said, are you telling me you're not going to allow me to take the test? He said, no, I didn't say that. And the secretary was a racist. She was just bowing and looking at cutting eyes at me and him. So I had learned that three or four porters had took the test and they failed. He said, the manager told him they had failed. So he let me, he, I said, you're not gonna let me do Yes, you can get it. So when I took the test, he said, uh, well, what time do you come to work? I said, I'm off today. Well, I have it graded when you come back. I said, I'm off today and I can stay here until you get time to do it. <laughs> so he just kind of chuckled and he read it off. The questions and answers were there. I just had to mouth the right one. 64 was passing, and I made 69. 69 uh, is a good passing, Mark Rosa, but you haven't been exposed uh, to this kind of work, and it's going to be kind of hard. I said, Passing was 64, and what did you make on 69. You made 69. Uh -huh. he, he said, well, you're not like the porters. They have been exposed to it because they have to handle the baggage and that kind of thing. I said, are you still telling me you're not gonna let me try? Mm -hmm. What job were you? I was a maid, okay. yeah. and I was going to information. Okay, mm -hmm. and was information, was that a, a previously a white job? All white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what happened? Well, did I you, passed. Did you get the job? Uh, at first, they had a, a bus driver who had his health had stopped him from driving buses and he was in the baggage room. And when he learned that I had passed and the, the shift was posted, he started watching me. If I went out to the dumpster, he'd run and peep to see where I went. If I went to go around to the color waiting room, he was peeping to see where I was. So uh, I discovered he was watching me and some of the other fellows say, he's watching you, he's watching you. So I started out and he saw me go and he didn't see me. He ran back and looked and he didn't see me. I hid behind the telephone booth. And uh, he came to the window peeping and while he was peeping at the window, a customer came up, a shipper. And he started writing the shipper up and it was three minutes to four. You had to sign it before four o'clock. I signed and he saw me, he come running back there. You needn't be signing, I'm, you needn't be signing. I'm, I'm, I'm too old to wait back here, I'm tired of lifting all this mess. I'm going in the information, you're not going in there. I said, that's your privilege. And I turned and walked off. But God took care of that. He wasn't in there two months before he called him in. Mm -hmm. And I went in there. So you eventually would, would get the, the position that you had. Uh, yes, but at first I went in the baggage room. I took that shift. Mm -hmm. But when the luggage was too heavy or packages from the waiting room, the window that was exposed to the white waiting room, they would, the men would tell them to come around, come inside the baggage room. But when I started, they told me I couldn't do it. I had to lift it. And they disqualified me on those grounds. That you couldn't lift? Lift the luggage like I should. Uh -huh. So after he left, the shift was open. Somebody, uh, my vacation was coming up in about two weeks or three. They let somebody work double until I went on my vacation. When I come back, one of the men had passed, one of the porters, and he was in there. And I come back, I ask, how did he get in there? And I have more seniority. And they, they told me that blah, 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 blah. But anyway, 
I went to the union representative. Well, he told me, well, when you, when Wednesday comes, you just go on in there. You qualify. And when I went in there, this guy was named Johnny Green. He was sitting in there and the supervisors monitoring us, heard the two voices, so they called Johnny out. And none of, one ticket agent would help me sometime. The woman that worked in there would meet me every morning for me to share my breakfast with her. She sat with her back to me and was so hostile and ugly to me. And I was trying, and uh, they wouldn't let me take a, a, book, a manual home where I could study with it. And one night I was seeing a relative off, and I was carrying her luggage, and Mr. Jim Nelly, who was a very liberal man, of Italian, he saw me and he said, Rosa, are you all, where are you going? And I told him, he said, well, I want you to come in the office before you leave, dispatcher's office. When I went in, he said, I hear that they're thinking about disqualifying you, but if anybody can do it, I know you can. You have the pleasant voice and you can read, you can see, and they did not treat you right. They gave you two days training and give everybody else two weeks training. And I'm going to have you to know what you're doing when you leave here tonight. I stayed from, and he told my husband, you can sit down over there or you can go back to your car and lay down. But when Rosa goes out of here, she's going to know how to find her routings. He kept me in there from 9.15 until he was off, 12 o'clock. The next morning, I was off, and my husband got, woke me up. He had prepared breakfast, and he told me, I said, oh, you're so smart. You're fixing breakfast, and it's not Saturday morning. He'd always make breakfast Saturday. He said, yes, if God put Mr. Nally into your life to strengthen you to keep your job, I'm your husband. I'm going to stay closer than he did. You're not going to do anything today but eat, sleep, and stay with that book. Mr. Nally gave me. Uh, a discarded manual, what they call a Russell Guide, and told me how to use it. When I went back to work the next day, this woman that had been sitting with her back to me said, huh, what happened to you? What kind of smarty pills you been taking? I said, I took the Lord in prayer and he sent me a friend. So you then retained that job. I retained that job. And for 14 years and four months. 14 years and four months, and that's where you, you retired that's from? That's where there. I retired from. It's been really a pleasure sitting and talking with you today because you have really given, you've educated us. <laughs> and Thank you. I certainly appreciate that because, as I said earlier, what we're doing, we hope to eventually write what we're determined to be the real history of Birmingham. The only way that we can write that history is to get it from people like yourself. Thank you again for coming. And the blessed part of it, when I retired, they said I could choose any place in the city I wanted to go to dinner. And Mr. Herman Hardick was assistant supervisor. He and his wife would escort me and my husband. And I chose the club. <laughs> oh, so you went to the club. Went to the club, and I was seated where I could look all over the city oh. and see the view. What year was that? What year did I retire? Seven to seven, October seventeenth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you you have gone to the club. Went to the and, club. And and got your reward. Right. That's right. <laughs> Good. Thank you again for coming out and we certainly appreciate it. I have enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sweet.